Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I'm going to be talking today about something that is a little bit on the technical side, but also really, really important, and that's adjustment of data. The weather <coughs> is one thing. You know, you measure the temperature and, you know, the daytime highs, daytime lows, and those are absolutes. You put those into the historical record and you think, well, when you combine an average all those, that makes up the climate. But the reality is, is that once it gets into the record, people start fiddling with it. And that ends up changing some things. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and this adjusted data is being used to uh, justify a climate emergency. You know, there's lots of folks that say, well, the temperature is going way up. And because it's going way up, we have a climate emergency. Well, maybe not. A lot of it had to do with the fact that the way the data is gathered and processed makes it look a little different than what it actually is. Now, in my town, where I live in California, Chico, California, we have the Chico State University Farm, where they have been doing uh, measurements of the temperature for a long time. It's uh, away from the main part of town, so it's away from uh, the urban heat island. And as you can see here, we have two bits of data that are plotted, and you can see that we have... Um, the unadjusted data, which is in amber. And it's essentially flat. If you go back to uh, about 1910, you can see that uh, the temperature there isn't that much different than what we're experiencing today. In 2017, it was uh, just a little bit lower than 1934 when it peaked. That was the hottest year ever in California and in Chico. And uh, 2018 is actually just a little cooler than that. So where is the climate emergency here? The uh, answer is, well, if you look at the data, there really isn't. The problem that we've got is that there's these adjustments that go on in the climate data. And these adjustments are used to basically fit all the data together into one data set to get a global average. And it's higher than you might think. You know, we've got differences in the way uh, stations have been moved and located and so forth and so on. And so they're trying to adjust for all of this and to make everything you know, one standard record. The problem is, is that in doing so, they are creating artifacts. Here, for example, is Darwin, Australia. And as you can see in the green, um, that was the original record. And then it goes to the blue. Well, they made some adjustments where they changed the green. They chopped off part of the green between 1890 and 1910 because they decided the data wasn't valid for some reason. And then the other data, after 1910 up to about 1940, they lowered and so you get this new trend. It looks like it's going way up, but that's not reality. That is simply an adjustment, an after-the-fact adjustment. That is not a real measure of the climate. Here we have, um, excuse me here. Yeah. Here we have um, the entire record for Australia. Now you can see here that the adjustments have been made recently by a change in the data set. And it went from the amber to the red. The red has a steeper slope, and thus the climate is warming faster based on this new data. And this is happening all over the world, not just in Australia. Here is Iceland. Here's Reykjavik, Iceland, the capital of Iceland. And if you can see, the blue there is the original data. The red is the adjusted data. And if you were to draw a line between the red and the blue, the red is steeper. More climate alarm, more worry, because the temperature is increasing faster. But in reality, it is not. It's an adjustment. And as you can see here, there's, uh, they, they cooled some of the past. They dropped some of the temperature down. If you look to the far left of the graph there, you've got some faint amber and faint purple. You can see that those things were dropped, and that is where the real change happens. In what other branch of science do they get to change the data in the past? <laughs> I know of no other branch of science where this is allowed, but if somehow climate science gets the pass. Here's um, a, a temperature station not too far, 155 miles away from Reykjavik, and the adjustment goes in a different way. They actually warm the pass so, ever so slightly. And so you've got to wonder, which adjustment are they applying here is correct? How do they know it was warmer in the path on this station and cooler in the path in this one. It's an arbitrary thing based on algorithms is what's really going on. Washington, D.C. Well, it doesn't look too alarming. You can see it looks pretty flat there. But they've actually made some changes to make the path different too. And part of it had to do with an algorithm I just mentioned. It's called homogenization. 
they do that to account for urban effects, but what they've actually done here is made the past warmer. But the city was smaller 100 years ago. There were less people. There was less urban heat island effect. How do you, how do you rationalize that? I know of no way you can do that. Now, here's Madrid, Rotero Park. Been around for a long time. It was owned by the Spanish monarchy at one point. And you can see they've done an adjustment there. They've changed the temperature data in the past. And, but the present temperature data over on the far right has no adjustments. And again, this changes the slope, changes the slope of the temperature increase over time, making it appear that things are warming faster. But you go a little further north to another town called Navasarada, which is about, uh, oh, it's about 49 kilometers away. And you look at its uh, temperature data, and you can see that it's got similar peaks in the present and in the past. Not a whole lot of trend if you look at that. But look what they did to the data. They dropped the data in the past. Let's go back and forth here. You can see very clearly the past has been changed. And now if you look at the trend, the trend has increased. And this is a town that's in the mountains, away from urban influences, and it's been around for a long time. So they're taking almost pristine data and changing it by an arbitrary algorithm to do homogenization. That is it. One word. Homogenization is the main reason that climate data goes from being eh, a little bit of warming to, oh my, a lot of warming. That's where the alarm comes in. Homogenization is basically there to remove non-climatic changes in the data. Things like uh, changes in the station location, changes in the way things were measured, change in the time of day it was measured, things like that. They're trying to get all of this stuff out of the data. And it seems like a reasonable approach to do this, right? But here's the problem. It creates changes where there aren't any. It mixes data from bad nearby stations, maybe stations that have been compromised, with data from good stations. And then you end up with kind of a, a mix that isn't all that pure or pristine. So here's something I did with the surface station project. We looked at weather stations all over the United States. And based on a rating that was put out in a, in a scientifically established paper, we looked at these stations and rated them by how close they are to influences, man-made influences. And the best ones, like for example, in Cheyenne Wells, Colorado, had a rating of one. There's not much around it to bias the temperature. And as it gets progressively closer to human habitation, and human infrastructure, the rating increases all the way up to a rating of five where you see the University of Tucson, the University of Arizona, Arizona of Tucson has a rating of five. The weather station there is actually in a parking lot. They were measuring the temperature for climate studies in a parking lot. And this was the Department of Atmospheric Sciences doing this, people that should know better. Now, how did this happen? Well, it's because this was a land grant university and Originally, the weather station was way out in the boonies. It was around, you know, the farming area and so forth. Well, as the university grew, well, we got to use this patch of land to put up this new building and this patch of land to put up this new building. And eventually, the weather station keeps getting moved around. Finally, when they used up all their available land in their land-grant university, there was no place else to put it but in the parking lot outside in, in front of the Atmospheric Sciences Building. And, of course, when you look at the data from that, it was like, boom! Because, you know, climate in the parking lot, that's really what we got to measure, right? Here's one in Oklahoma. This was Ardmore, Oklahoma, a station I visited. That little arrow there shows the temperature sensor right next to the street. <laughs> and then there's one in uh, Perry, Oklahoma, near the fire station. You can see a vehicle parked right next to it. You could park right up next to that sensor, and the heat from the radiator would go up into that sensor. And you can see this wall from this infrared picture here that absorbs sunlight during the day and radiates it at night. This is where science was measuring data to use in climate studies. In what branch of science would anyone get away with data that's polluted? I know of none. So when you look at all of the weather stations that are used for measuring climate around the United States, and we published a paper on this called Fall et al. 2011, we're working on another one, we demonstrated that about 92% of the weather stations in the NOAA network had <laughs> issues. They were faulty. They were biased. As things got closer to them, 
they warmed up. And it's a simple thing to understand. For those of you that have ever stood next to a brick building uh, in the early evening and you feel the heat from the sun that it picked up during the day radiating off of it at night, that's really the effect that's going on here. The effect is it's warming the nighttime temperature. Concrete, asphalt, buildings, all this infrastructure that we've built up over the last hundred years is warming the nighttime temperature. It's taking the sunlight from the daytime and re-releasing it as infrared at night, warming the nighttime temperature. Climate is calculated by an average of the high and the low temperature. And so what's happening is most of the global warming that we're seeing is in the low temperature. The high temperatures really haven't changed all that much. And so when we've got all these bad stations and a few good stations, and they get mixed together by this homogenization process to get a surface for the United States or for the world to represent the average temperature, it's basically like mixing water. Imagine, if you will, you've got some water bowls. And these water bowls go from number one, which is clear, pure water, to number five, which is muddy water. Each one of those represents a state of a station, its value or its... Uh, it's characteristic. So if you start mixing data that has, you know, clear versus muddy water and call that a result, you end up muddying all the data. And that's what's happening in climate science. The homogenization process muddies all of the climate data. We end up with a measurement of mud, essentially. So when you look at trends of the good stations that we identified, the class one stations, that have not been compromised versus the stations that are bad, the class three, four, and fives, we find that the compliant stations have a trend of about two one hundredths uh, per decade. And whereas the uh, class one to five all of them is about three or three tenths. So there's a big difference there. And if you plot that out, you can see here the difference between the good and the bad stations. The blue represents the best station. The orange and the red represents the worst station and all the stations together. So clearly the bad data and the good data have been mixed together, resulting in a higher temperature trend. Why are we continuing to use bad data? Hey, imagine if this was stock market data and someone went and adjusted it and then said, okay, here's our new, uh, here's our new trend for our company. We, we've adjusted the data to make it look a little better. You think that would fly with the SEC? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But in climate science, that kind of adjustment does. We basically end up with <laughs> something we like to call the adjustacy. <laughs> where you're cool in the path and warm in the future, and you don't know what you got in between. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our channel and consider donating to the Heartland Institute to support more vibrant free markets, greater individual liberties, and more videos like this one.